All right, you guys, so GHK Copper or GHKCU. Another name is Glycyl Histidyl Lysine. GHK is a naturally occurring tripeptide and it's made up of three amino, three amino acids. Gl glycine, which is the G, histidine, which is the H, and lysine, which is the K. I don't know who in the hell decided to make lysine K and not L, so it's, it should really be GHL in my opinion, but anyways. GHK, one of the many weird name things in science, it really, really likes to bind to copper. GHK is a, is a peptide on its own made of three amino acids, and then that peptide has a high affinity for copper. And copper is a very, very antibacterial, antiviral substance, you guys. So copper on its own seems to have a lot of good properties as far as health and well-being goes. And GHK is really, really heavily studied as far as hair loss goes, skin regeneration, nervous tissue, bone, lungs, liver. GHK is in a lot of skincare products. It is really, really helpful for hair loss. That's one of the primary things that people use it for. And it helps with a whole lot of other stuff, which we're gonna talk about. GHK modulates the expression of a bunch of cancer-causing genes, just like thymus and alpha-1 does. GHK and thymus and alpha-1 both are very, very helpful for certain types of cancer, and they may be helpful for more types of cancer that we don't know about that haven't been studied. But GHK reverses the expression of 70% of the genes in a certain gene signature for metastatic colon cancer or metastasis prone colon cancer. That's from what we can understand about this one type of colon cancer. 70% of the genes that get turned on too much that lead to this type of colon cancer get turned down secondary to GHK treatment and therapy. By taking GHK, you're turning down the expression of the genes that are producing the proteins that are leading to you getting certain types of cancer. That, that's how these things are working. Really, really interesting. Again, just like thymus and alpha-1, thymus and beta-4, BPC-157, GHK has been around for quite a long time. It's been around since the 1970s. They were what they did with this study was they they were injecting the plasma of young people into the liver of old people. They're injecting GHK into the liver of old people from young people, and it caused the old livers to look more like young livers, so the cells themselves. And this is how one of the ways through which BPC-157 is seen to be working, thymus and beta-4, thymus and alpha-1, they're really, really helpful at improving the base materials that our body needs to function properly. If we have unusual expression of certain genes due to environmental factors, chronic stress, eating badly, not exercising, putting these peptides into the body really stimulates a significant amount of healing because it's giving your body the more, more of the base elements that it needs or the building blocks that it needs or the building materials that it needs to do stuff those are the proteins if it doesn't have the proper proteins the the genes aren't being expressed enough to per, to produce those proteins the body does not have the basic building materials that it needs to function properly just like nad plus it really really helps to take ghk especially as we start to age you guys because all of these peptides that are really really he healing and healthy they decline as we begin to age so this is seen in nad plus it's seen in a lot of vitamins and minerals and it's seen in these peptides there is one study of blood plasma for medical students at, at university of california san francisco average age of 25 the ghk in the students was measured at 200 nanograms per milliliter while the medical school faculty, their GHK was measured at 60 nanograms per milliliter. In another study, you guys, in the blood plasma of medical students from University of California, San Francisco, they took samples of blood from the, student, the medical students, average age, age of 25, and then they took the blood of the professors at the medical school, average age of 60. The concentration of GHK in the 25-year-olds was 200 nanograms per milliliter, and the concentration of GHK in the 60-year-olds was 80 nanograms per milliliter, so less than half. From the age of 25 to 60, our GHK levels fall in half on average per this study. That is a massive, massive decrease, and this is just it's this is one of the ways that people are trying to look into how we can slow down aging you guys so the things that our body starts to produce less of in general as we age 
a big number of those substances seem to help improve health and well-being, mental health, physical health, and they help they seem to slow down aging if you can amplify the concentrations of those certain things as we age. Again, remember you guys, exercise does the same thing to all these peptides as taking the peptides does, just not in in such a tremendous way. It doesn't do it as forcefully or as much, but it still does it. So that should sh that should show us something. Same thing with dry needling, you guys. Things that mimic the effects of exercise seem to be healthy and healing for the human body in the, in the proper quantities. Really, really cool stuff. Again, GHK is modulating the way that the genes are expressed. So genes need to be turned on to produce those amino acids that produce GHK. However, if you put GHK into the body, it does have a downstream effect on the genes themselves. The, the environment that the genes are in determines what genes are gonna be expressed and how they're gonna be expressed. So if you can change the cellular environment through things like nutrition, supplementation, peptide therapy, eating well, exercise, treatments like dry needling, hiking, stuff like that, it just helps amplify the amount of these peptides in our cells and it gives the cells a better environment to be in which changes the way that the genes themselves are expressed. So here's some potential dosing for GHK copper, you guys. So this is from Dr. Edwin Lee. Again, Clinical Peptide Society. He's a really, really good person to look at. So his suggested dosing, it comes in a topical spray or a dropper. This is for, this is for hair, five milligrams per day. He says it takes about three months to see the results. So that's one potential dosing schedule with a topical spray or a dropper. And then here's another one for injections, clinical results have been observed with 2.5 milligrams subcutaneously three times a week. Just like thymosin alpha-1, thymosin beta-4, BPC-157, very, very safe, well-tolerated, works on a bunch of different levels, and it in general makes people healthier and makes their cells work better, including the mitochondria, the amount of ATP we can produce, all that stuff gets better. So GHK has been extensively studied for tissue remodeling and wound healing, you guys, for, for about four decades. So remember, GHK is in a lot of skincare products. It, GHK increases the expression of something called basic fibroblast growth factor, or BFGF, and vascular, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. Then both of those things help with blood vessel formation and they help damaged tissues regenerate. Now again, you guys remember, there are studies and there's there's some question in the literature about things that increase VEGF, vasco, vascular endothelial growth factor, that theoretically, if you already have active cancer, that could theoretically elevate the growth of that cancer. However, a lot of these studies show that taking GHK does not increase the cancer and it actually helps fight it off. Exercise also increases VEGF, so just keep that in mind. Exercise is very healthy when you have cancer, that also increases VEGF. We don't understand at all how all this stuff is working with cancer. If we did, we would fit, We would be able to fix cancer. Cancer is one of the po most poorly understood factors in medicine and it's one of the biggest money makers in the country, which are two bad it, that's a bad combination because if they're already making a ton of money on it, the people that are running the system are super duper resistant to changing it, even if it means helping and healing people because the more people they heal, the less money they make. And those companies, you guys, and the government and our public health systems, they are based on how much money can we make. Health does not come into the question whatsoever. The RDA is not based on health. Remember, the RDA is based on the minimum amount that you need on average in your age group, if you're male or female, to be not sick. GHK, just like BPC-157, does increase VEGF. However, neither one of these things have specifically been shown to increase the likelihood that your cancer is gonna go the wrong direction. Just keep that in mind. That is one thing that's met mentioned in the literature. At low concentrations, GHKs are really, really helpful for healing capillary cells to build new blood vessels, which is one of the things that you need to regrow hair, you guys. That's one of the ways that it's working. And it's a really, really, powerful migration stimulant for macrophages, mast cells, and other white blood cells. Just like with BPC-157 and thymosin beta-4, thymosin alpha-1, if you inject it in your stomach, it, your body knows what to do with it and, it and it transports it to the areas of most need. It, GHK also in, increases bone healing, osteoblastic cell attachment, and this is possible 
through a mechanism working with collagen synthesis. So we don't know that for sure. Um, but they've, they've shown lots and lots of good studies looking at this. And remember you guys, collagen is the most prominent protein throughout the human body. Things that help improve our collagen function are typically really, really healthy for us. GHK seems to be one of the things that does that. It's been studied, GHK has been studied a lot, you guys. It accelerates wound healing, helps restore normal tissue architecture, helps with the regulation of remo tissue remodeling, working with the collagen pathways possibly, it reduces inflammation and reduces antioxidation. So same thing a lot of these other peptides are doing, they're just all working on slightly different pathways because they're different stuff, but they're all working in harmony with each other. It's got a really, really good safety profile, just like all, um, all these other peptides. Again, GHK is one that has has been used even though people may not know that they're using it it's in a lot of skincare products it's been used for years in 2012 there's a study by Metalka et al and uh, they hypothesize that because GHK elevates the expression of the p63 gene and protein it may induce apopt apoptosis in neuroblastoma cells or, or in put it in other terms it helps gobble up cancer cells GHK does increase VEGF however just because something increases VEGF doesn't mean that it's going to do anything poorly for your cancer. And in a lot of these studies, like it's been shown, it really, really helps with cancer. So again, just because something increases one molecule in the body and that molecule is also seen to increase in people with cancer, or it's hypothesized that it could harm people with cancer, that doesn't mean it's going to. We can see these studies, we can look at the actual data, and we can look at the real human the human trials and human outcomes and people that are taking it and have a pretty good idea of the overall effect of it. So if it's safe and there's more benefit for you than potential harm, that is something that you can decide to do. But there's basically no serious risk factors um, for these things as far as these studies go. Tumor protein 63 or TP63, that gene provides instruction for making a protein called tumor protein 63. TP63 functions as a transcription factor. So it attaches to certain regions of the DNA and controls the activity of particular genes. So transcription factors, you guys, are little proteins that attach to the outside of the DNA that change what parts of that six feet of DNA in the inside of each cell that's wrapped around the nucleosome. It, it, it alters which parts of that DNA are expressed, which means it alters which genes are expressed, which means it, it alters which proteins are made, which alter how our body is functioning. So TP63 interacts with other proteins to turn on some genes, turn off other genes, and it helps regulate and optimize numerous cell activities, including cell growth, proliferation, division, differentiation, cell adhesion, and it helps with cellular cleanup. So really, really helpful on a, on a bunch of different levels through changing the epigenome. And remember, we go over the epigenome, what it is, how, how we can modify it in depth, in detail, in the epigenetics and epigenome class, you guys. GHK also plays a central role in the, in the development of limbs, facial features, and generalized neural development when we're in our mom's belly. So just like with folate, not folic acid, folic acid is a poison. We go over that one in the nutrition and supplementation classes, you guys, and the epigenome class and the intro class. But folic acid, just FYI, is a alien man-made substance that exists nowhere on planet Earth. Human beings have only been exposed to it in a couple of countries, including the United States, for only about 50 years. Zero human beings should take folic acid because 50% of the population can't break it down into the, into the bioavailable form, 5-MTHF or 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Take the other classes to see exactly how the methylation process is working and how taking folic acid can lead to something called unmetabolized folic acid syndrome. So here's a study looking at the lethal dose of GHK in mice. So the lethal dose for 50% of mice in this one study was eight milligrams for a 25 gram mouse. If that's extrapolated to human, humans, that's about 320 milligrams of GHK per kilogram of body weight would be the lethal dose if it holds per this mouse study. So for humans, the lethal dose, more or less somewhere around 320 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. If you were a 70 kilogram human or around 150 pounds, the lethal dose of GHK would be 22,400 milligrams. 
that just like with BPC-157 is thousands of times over the standard dose that you would be taking. So it's extremely safe. Just like with a lot of the other supplements, NMN, NR, omega-3s, GHK reduces the expression of, of pro-inflammatory genes that produce pro-inflammatory proteins like tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. It helps with fibrosis. And again, in this bottom study here, GHK produced suppression of many cancer metastasis genes at one micromolar. This level has been used in experiments. It's, it's really, really important to help regulate certain aspects of cancer metastasis. In another study, GHK increased fibroblast production of a protein called decorin by 302%. That's a huge increase of a protein that a gene is making. Taking GHK increased the amount of decorin that was produced by 302%. And 2% at one nan nanomolar, and the decorum protein plays a role in collagen fiber assembly, assembly, tumor suppression, enhances autophagy, and inhibits inflammation. It does, GHK we know does one thing that could theoretically amplify cancers, however, all of the other things that it does seem to override that, that potentiality, and it actually improves a, a bunch of different types of cancers. So GHK summary, you guys. So it's a naturally occurring copper peptide and it declines with age, just like NAD plus does. It upregulates a number of cancer suppressors and downregulates a number of genes associated with cancer progression. GHK reverses expression of genes associated with early stages of aggressive metastatic colon cancer, mod modulates gene expression in COPD lung tissue, so it reverses the expression of genes that cause COPD in a lot of people, and it alters gene expression in general to be more homeostatic and more healing. So it's really, really helpful for antioxidation, anti-inflammation, helps with wound healing, helps with breakdown and synthesis of collagen, bone, all that stuff. It's a regulatory mo a molecule that has, this one, like a lot of these peptides, you guys, is very, very common across a bunch of different species of stuff. So like the sirtuin genes and proteins, those are in everything from yeast to human beings. GHK is kind of the same thing. So genes that are highly conserved across species tend to be really, really important. The genes that produce certain proteins, if a bunch of different species of, the, of, of animals have them, they seem to do really, really important things. And if we can find the ones like all these peptides where amplifying the concentration helps us heal better, without basically any safety risks, there's zero reason why these shouldn't be mainstream treatment in 100% of primary care offices. These should be one of the first lines of defense against all sorts of neurodegeneration, cancer, and all this stuff, COVID, viruses, bacteria. These are basically as safe as any medicine can get. These are natural proteins that are already in our body, and they've been studied. There's research on them. It all shows that they're safe, and they're still... This, none of this stuff is taught in medical school, you guys.